Hey everybody, welcome to Hormonally Speaking. I'm your host, Christine Garvin, and I'm really excited today to have my guest um, because it's on a particular subject that's of uh, you know real importance to me in my life right now. So I love talking about this, this arena, and it's really um, something I feel like uh, women don't understand that much, and that's both perimenopause and the transition to menopause. So we're going to dive into, you know, what all of those, uh, what that looks like, what those are about, what the differences are, how you know um, that you're in them. And the guest I have with me today is named Maria Claps, and she's a certified health coach, a functional diagnostic, diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and she's mom to four grown boys. After receiving inadequate health care that did nothing to address her perimenopause problems, which I know a lot of women can relate to, Maria enrolled in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in order to help herself. After that, she pursued several hormone-centric trainings, including Dr. Sarah Gottfried's Practitioner Hormone Training Program, the Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Program, and she also has been mentored by hormone scholar and scientist, Dr. Lindsay Berkson. Maria helps women all over the world as a perimenopause and menopause mentor via her Thrive Over 45 program. She's a Dutch hormone test expert. Ooh, we're going to dive into some of that too. She also teaches health coaches and other wellness practitioners in a mentorship program called Midlife Hormone Mastery. Welcome, Maria. Hi, Christine. I'm really excited to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. So, you know, um, I, we kind of went back and forth a little bit uh, beforehand just with some of the questions. And really, I wanted to start from a place of, I think a lot of women don't understand what perimenopause is and how they know when they're in it, right? Because our kind of traditional allopathic approach doesn't really teach us much. So can you kind of walk us through that to start? Sure. So let's go back to geometry. Peri just means around and or like as a perimeter, perimenopause around the time of menopause. And it's highly individual, but it can be two years prior to menopause. It can start, it can possibly start like up to 10 years prior. Um, and really the way that we know that we're in it is um, we, there are some pretty profound shifts in the body. Now, the most obvious one is a change in the menstrual cycle either decreasing or increasing frequency. Okay, that is the one that sends most women like, oh, I'm pregnant, or, um, or what the heck is happening? Like getting a period once a month is plenty, but now it's happening twice a month. <laughs> so frequent or, or missing periods is usually the big wake up call, like what the heck is going on? Yeah. Yeah. So what are some others? Because, you know, I, I, I feel like some women are like, okay, suddenly I'm just feeling more off or I'm not sleeping as well. Or, you know, so would you consider, you know, some of these other symptoms perimenopausal before even maybe the period shifts? Yes. Yes. So increasingly worse or a PMS or PMS that just kind of seems to appear out of nowhere. Um, and then lack of sleep or, you know, just very disordered sleep, uh, is a big one <laughs> as well. So yeah, that those are, and then like just anxiety and irritability, right. which, you know, I always say we we're meant to kind of feel all the feels as women and we can't ever like, you know, some, I want to say that because women are like, well, you know, it's my kids or my job or my life. Um, yeah, to a degree perhaps, but like, if you've noticed that, these have really intensified once you say hit 42 or something. You know, it's a call to see what really is going on. And, and let's not just blame it on everyone around us. Right, right. And I think that that's what happens a lot, right, is women, because we've been geared towards kind of to look outside of us and all the things that are going on outside of us, you know, we, we don't necessarily think, okay, there's this whole hormonal change and, and thing happening um, that, you know, that I can actually do something about to support my body. You know, they just, I, I know clients come to me and they're just like, yeah, I just feel kind of like crazy when I didn't feel this way before, you know? So what are some of the things that, you know, you recommend to women as they enter into this perimenopausal stage of their life? Well, um, okay. So I think this is going to come as a little bit of a surprise because it, because it's not like, 
um, something tangible, um, but it's really like education. And that is like really stop and think and become educated. That's what I had to do. Um, and like really truly realize what is going on in the body physiologically, mentally, emotionally, because it really is going to set the stage for the entire rest of your life. And I always say, you know, if we're lucky, we can live half of our lives, um, maybe 40%, 30%, I don't know, but post-menopausal. And so really that's what is happening. You are, you know, it's kind of silly to say we're moving towards menopause. We literally, from the day we're born, a baby is aging, a baby is moving toward, female baby is moving towards menopause. But like it really seems to present itself and, sh and um, uh, really kind of almost exponentially we're moving towards menopause once we are obviously clearly in perimenopause. So you have to think about all that that entails. And, um, you know, it, that's, that's the, like just a big part of what I do is just educate women around that, let them know. And, and then part of that education, Christine, is, okay, how do we eat? How do we move? Do we do it differently? Do we need tweaks? Um, what about hormone replacement therapy? Is that something that I want to consider? Most women make that, make that decision uh, either through fear, misinformation, or inaction. Mm. And it is actually a decision in and of itself. But that's a big decision as well. So uh, um, just to really get educated about it. Right, right. And so do you feel like, um, you know, that it's a good idea for most women once they're starting to experience this to dive into getting, say, you know, hormone testing like the Dutch? Or is it a better idea to kind of start with, okay, let me shift some of my, my food first, you know, do some particular maybe supplements to support the transition, look at sleep, those kinds of things. What is kind of your, your approach? Yeah. Uh, no, I say do a Dutch because we can like, if you're, again, I'm just going to throw out 42, 43, but, which by the way, I have noticed after working with hundreds of clients, and again, I hate to put like specific numbers on things because, um, because we're all so different, but there, there's something about that 42 to 43 age that I just know that it, I've just seen there's some, some massive changes, um, on that journey from 42 to 43 at some place but so it's dutch test really empowers women if it does nothing else even if it's imperfect in its measurements and all tests are imperfect um it really really empowers women especially when they have a practitioner who can spend a full hour explaining what this test means explaining um you know what they can do uh, nutritionally um you know, emotionally, exercise-wise. So yeah, I absolutely recommend the Dutch test. Yeah, and uh, you know, people, if you've been listening to this podcast, you've heard me talk about the the Dutch test before and kind of in depth. But for those that haven't heard about that before, it's actually you know a dried urine analysis. And what's great about it compared to say your traditional blood tests is you get to see not only you know, your, your estrogens, your three estrogens, your progesterone, your DHEA, your testosterone, but you get to see how those metabolize, which can give us a lot of information, right? And then also our cortisol, which is such an important underlying component to our overall hormone health, which a lot of people don't necessarily understand. And you know, I, um, at 30, got 38, I guess. I, I don't know when it started developing, but you know, I, um, I found out at 39 that I had a relatively large fibroid. And, you know, and that to me now, with my knowledge now, I was like, okay, I really kind of started going probably through perimenopause a little bit early, you know, and, and just in terms of like progesterone starting to drop and that kind of thing, even though my cycle was still quote unquote normal. I mean, the fibroid threw that off, so it wasn't, you know, but if I had the, you know, if I had the knowledge, then what I know now, especially with, about the Dutch test, I would have done that then. Right. Cause I just, I had no idea. And there was not a, re a whole lot out there. Um, allopathically about, you know, what to do around fibroids other than they'll give you an estrogen um, inhibitor, essentially drug or surgery, which is what I ended up having. And as those that follow this know, that didn't turn out so well for me. So, you know, definitely I highly recommend that women when they start feeling off, yeah, to go ahead and do the Dutch test with a practitioner that knows what they're doing, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
you know, what, what are some of the things that you tend to see maybe on the Dutch test with in that age range, that 42 to 43, since you've kind of seen that transition happen for women a lot in that age? A little bit of unsteadiness in adrenal health. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, you know, and also another thing that I'm seeing is um, what look, what's looking more and more like a B12 deficiency. Mm, I, I see that a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The B12 and the iron and the vitamin D, you know, I mean, those are, that doesn't show up on that test, um, the iron or the vitamin D, but I see that in a lot of clients when they get, get that taken. Yeah. So yeah. Do you know what, what's going on with that, with the B12? I like, I'm always trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, almost part and parcel due to low stomach acid. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need, um, we need stomach acid um, to help us absorb the B12 that we eat from our wonderful grass-fed beef or, or our eggs. Yeah. And I can tell you that if you're over 40, you're, you're deficient in stomach acid. Yeah. 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 So I mean, if you're over 25, you might be deficient in yeah. stomach acid. So I'm really glad you brought that up because I definitely have a hard time convincing some clients of the low stomach acid, you know, particularly obviously when they've, you know, had, <clears throat> excuse me, acid reflux, things like that, you know, and trying to explain mm -hmm. to them. But, you know, for me, interestingly enough, like I've been doing um, HCL supplementation and digestive enzyme supplementation for a while, but you know, I just recently found out from a GI map that I have H. pylori. Oh, right? yeah, we need to check that first. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so that's another thing a lot of people don't realize that, you know, having something like H. pylori is going to inhibit your stomach acid production, which is going to go right. and affect all these things like your B12, you know. It, yeah. it, you know, low stomach acid has very diverse, um, it doesn't like sound it, like it's so negative, but it has really diverse effects. In fact, I always tell my clients, because I do work with women primarily over, you know, between the ages of 45 and 60, mm -hmm. um, like strong stomach acid is one of your best anti-aging tools. Mm. Super important. Can you, yeah. can you explain that a little bit more? Like what you yeah. mean? So, so one thing is that, um, um, we, it's, it just gets a little bit, I and mean, I don't mean to be like the, a, you know, dame of, you know, doom saying over here, but we, it just, it gets a little bit harder to be healthy as we age. I guess the, there's less blood throat, flow through the liver, detoxification gets a little off. Um, when, here, I'll give you a little, a little funny, um, not so funny, but like a little bit of a interesting thing is that methylation, how we detox, right, is, um, is one way we actually kind of detoxify our estrogen through this process called methylation, which is just a chemical process that happens in the body. It's, it's detox. Let's just put it that way to make it super simple. But methylation actually goes off, goes wonky, is not as good when we're low in estrogen, which is what happens when we age. So it's very bi-directional. Mm -hmm. It's like we, we need to methylate the estrogen, but yet we need estrogen to help us methylate. It's, it's crazy. Right. So yeah, a little bit of a wild goose chase here. But um, so I, Christine, you, you asked me about stomach acid or. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I love it. I love it. It's all connected, right? I got on a little bit of a tangent. No, I love, I love tangents. Why it's important as we age, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, so also stomach acid, first um, line of defense against ingested pathogens whether that's going to be like a little leftover parasite in your sushi. Don't everyone shoot me for saying that. I know. <laughs> People just don't believe it. They're like, I'm in the United States. And it's like, it still happens. <laughs> We're talking about, you know, funny people think parasites are like uh, the provenance of third world countries. I'm like, no, they're everywhere. They, the they don't do Yeah. They don't see the borders and say, Oh, we're not going to go in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, first line of defense against ingested pathogens, um, less uh, than clean food, mm -hmm. all right? So it's really sort of like um, helps our immune system. And again, these things, you know, our immune system, our methylation, um, our neurotransmitters, these things all kind of tend to drop with age. So, you know, the more we can do to preserve those physiological functions in the body, 
and stomach acid is absolutely one of those is important. You know, let's just say that you, um, you take a B vitamin complex. Well, the reason why we take that with food, right? We don't take all supplements with food. Some are good with food, some are not. Is because we need stomach acid to break that, that capsule down to separate out those B vitamins and make them usable for the body. So, so many reasons. Yeah, yeah. I always you know, try and explain um, to clients and, and people kind of show them our digestive process and say, you know, stomach is the first place after it's gone through the esophagus. And this is really where, I mean, your digestion starts in your mouth, but really the big guns come out in your stomach with your stomach acid, right? And that's going to impact the whole rest of the process. Yeah. And how you digest and, and absorb nutrients and everything too. So I'm really glad that you brought that up because that's, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily equate even digestion in their hormones, much less something like stomach acid in their hormones. You know, I think it's really important. Yeah. So it, this came up for me when you're talking about estrogen um, and, and HCL and um, liver. Um, so what do you tend to see when women do the Dutch test, like around 42, 43? Do you see that their estrogen has gone higher or lower or is it kind of all over the place? So it's a really great question. So I love the Dutch test. Um, I've, I've done several hundred tests, again, on mostly on women over 40, because that's just who I kind of call in and work with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really feel like one measurement of estrogen taken on day 21 mm. is entirely valuable. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so whereas, and this is something that I feel is, really lacking in the functional medicine world. And that is that we think that women are estrogen dominant and I will be the first to say, yes, it's entirely possible to be estrogen dominant. It's a lot less common because really, um, or I should say, I should say it's a lot less common. Let, let's put it this way. Estrogen dominance in women over 40. And again, I use these numbers as a bit of a benchmark for, for conversation. Mm -hmm. This could happen younger as well. Mm -hmm. But really what it happens as, what, what, what its genesis, and it's, let's just say you end up in that luteal phase as estrogen dominant, mm -hmm. shown by a Dutch test, perhaps even shown by a blood test. What it is for midlife women is it started out as low estrogen around uh, right prior to ov ovulation. Mm -hmm. so, so here's how this happens. And I think this is really poorly understood. So about day 12 or day 13, you're really supposed to have a very, very nice, robust peak of estrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that peak of estrogen actually signals uh, LH hormone, which signals, um, which signals uh, ovulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you don't ovulate, so, so when you do ovulate, okay that's when you're going to make that progesterone mm -hmm. through, through ovulation. So now if you didn't ovulate, right, what happens is your progesterone is super low mm -hmm. and your estrogen is higher. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily high. It's mm -hmm. higher than the progesterone. But if you are not ovulating and ovulation, that is indicative of low estrogen. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so again, I really feel I'm on a bit of a mission to kind of change how people see uh, this estrogen dominance as we age. Women think they have too much estrogen. It's typically not the case. It's not the case. So yeah. in that case, you would see, I know with Dutch, it's a little tough with the progesterone because it's, you know, the, essentially they're kind of working back from the metabolites. But do you tend to see then, um, in those cases, mostly does the progesterone show low on the Dutch and like the estrogen may be kind of normal, but people think it's estrogen dominance because the estrogen is yeah. higher than the progesterone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what about, um, you know, I, I find this is a fascinating thing because I think different people see it in different ways in terms of say the estrogen is high, um, or even say that it is, uh, you know, more normal or on the higher range, but it's shunting down the 4-OH pathway, which, you know, for those that don't know, is considered the more, uh, quote unquote, cancerous pathway. And you want, um, you want your estrogen metabolized down more down the 2-OH pathway, which is more protective. So in that case, say the estrogen is maybe not that high, actually, you know, 
would you not want to do something like dim or is dim going to help because it's going to move things over to the 2OH? So, so no, you don't want to do dim if your estrogen is showing up as low. Mm -hmm. Um, even if, you know, there are other things that can be done. Um, dim is, dim is good. And I've seen it definitely change outcomes for people, which is fantastic. Um, but no, what I would do instead, only because with DIM, you're getting like a really super potent um, kind of concentrated extract. I would do, I would just do broccoli sprouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know for me, you know, I definitely had um, re relatively high estrogen on my Dutch, my recent Dutch. And so that was helpful for me to do the DIM. But I know a lot of women will jump into DIM without... Yeah, Nothing, and it can cause more, more, yeah, pain than anything else. Yeah, well, it, it it can potentially lower estrogen, and and you know, we don't always want to lower estrogen. Right, yeah. right. What are some? Are there other ways? I mean, I definitely, you know, the cruciferous vegetables is such a good thing, and the broccoli sprouts. Are there other ways to push into the two OH? Yeah, black, black seeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some like kind of phytoestrogens are are good to help that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, what, what do you like for your phase two, um, metabolism? Like what to, to help support that? Sorry, liver detox, phase two liver detox. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, I like to make sure that, um, that women are getting some like things like milk thistle can be good dandelion. Like if you're, um, if you like to eat dandelion greens, they're incredibly nourishing for the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they're they're a bit of a hard sell. They're really bitter. <laughs> I, like, I like bitter foods, but that I, I even struggle to like those. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You got to like sneak them in with other greens sometimes. Right. Or, or just, yes. Or, or do tea. a tea. Yeah. Just do a tea. Cause I find actually like a dandelion tea is, is not super bitter. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah. And then, um, just like something like a castor oil pack as well mm -hmm. i love castor oil packs i'm like all the time <laughs> i yeah. give them to me yeah. you know i i try and um, i mean for me personally i've used them so much because you know i, I had multiple surgeries and with yeah. scar tissue and everything but i you know try and let people know how nourishing it is to your liver too and um, they're they're really i'm a big fan of what i call sort of like old school remedies yeah, yeah. and you know that's an old school remedy yeah. and and I just remember like my Sicilian grandma growing up would make me fennel tea. Oh yeah. It's like that, that's an old school remedy. And then we've got like, you know, cod liver oil. How many of our moms are like, you got to take your cod liver oil. Like I love the old school remedies. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, they knew what they were doing, right? We make it a lot more complicated these days, right? Than, than it was. And yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wisdom of sorts in, in, in the wellness wisdom that you know that's pretty much all we had before the advent of antibiotics and super powerful genetically targeted therapies which i'm super thankful for to have those things right. but I love the old school remedies as well absolutely so. you know I, I mean i tell people all the time that especially um what i went through where i had sepsis like thank god antibiotics like hardcore antibiotics existed right or i would be dead but in the post time, you know, it is me rebuilding the gut bacteria that, well, that limits. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. And I have to tell you, and I've, I've been listening to your story, mm -hmm. and I have to say that just about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, really out of the blue, seemingly, um, my husband got sepsis. <gasps> oh, no. <gasps> and did you guys find out? You didn't find out what it was from? Mm. No, I, no. Gotcha. Hard, hard to say for sure. Boy, do I sure as heck wish. But here's the story. And you talked about the antibiotics and how they can be harmful for the gut. But I have a story for you. I'm going to really share this. His sepsis traveled to his heart. He got endocarditis, which created a hole in one of the valves. So he actually just about a week ago had open heart surgery. Oh my God. That... So here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. Take the damn antibiotics, everyone. Yeah. Because you know what? You can repair your gut. Yeah. You can, I mean, it's going it, to, it, it's going to damage your gut potentially, but you can repair your gut. Yeah. You can't easily repair 
a hole in a heart valve. No, absolutely. Yeah. So I get really frustrated with people in wellness that are like, well, you know, I saved a family member from having to take antibiotics and you can too. I'm like, you don't know that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, it, it's one thing to turn down antibiotics, you know, when you have a viral infection and your, your doctor's trying to give it to you, you know, and it's, it's another thing completely when, you, yeah, you're in a, it's a, it can be life or death situation. And definitely with sepsis, it's definitely a life or death situation. Life, yeah. life and death. And, and I have to tell you, I mean, I'll be honest with you, my 21 year old son, mm -hmm. I refuse antibiotics for him. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely did. I mean, he's he's 21. He's actually never had antibiotics in his entire Whoa. life. I didn't yeah. know anybody like that existed. Uh, today. Oh yeah, yeah. Um and and the others have only had them like once or twice, but um so I mean, I get it. I get that whole overreach, but just just get like a little smarter about it. Yep. And like let's not necessarily say uh well, you need to avoid it for your gut. So just I mean, you and I have both been through that, so I think we have a little bit more of a yeah. kind of bigger understanding of the benefits of antibiotics yeah how is he doing at this point he's finally doing good <laughs> oh good i know it's i i mean i actually just went through my dad had to get a heart valve replaced emergency mm -hmm. situation about a week ago um because his lungs filled up with fluid and they actually thought it was pneumonia at first but it turns out this heart valve was just kind of flapping in the wind you know, and they think because everything else was fine, they think um, it was some kind of virus at some point that uh, essentially targeted the heart valve and, and, and broke it down without his knowledge, you know. So, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy how this stuff can come on. So thankful for modern medicine in those instances, right? And then obviously with chronic long-term stuff, that's when we're very thankful for the wisdom of you know, our elders and, and things that came before that can really support. Yeah, sure. yeah. 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 Well, so let's talk a little bit about the transition from perimenopause to menopause. Cause I know that this is, you know, something that, um, a lot of women don't necessarily fully get and that this is what you know very well. So tell us about that. Sure. So hormones are dropping. Okay. Um, so, so whereas we've always been taught the story that estrogen is fluctuating, and progesterone is dropping, um, yes, estrogen is fluctuating, but at a lower level. Mm. So, you know, like in your 20s and 30s, it was fluctuating up here due to the 28-day cycle, you know, really low in the beginning, it spikes mid-cycle, um, it spikes a little bit in the luteal phase, it drops, so we go this beautiful rhythm, right? But when you're in perimenopause, and let's just for, just again, to kind of put context to the situation, let's just say 40s for you know for most women it's going to be 40s um you're you're still fluctuating but it's at a lower level mm -hmm. most of the times it really is um and but progesterone you know drops and i do say once progesterone drops it's never coming back it's never <laughs> Not back. Actually, yeah. matter, you know no no matter how much chase tree you do like i love chase tree chase tree is super helpful herb to me when I was in the beginning phases of perimenopause, but I, I have seen clinically that women lose ovarian response to chase tree. Mm. With time. So I'm, I'm a big believer in herbal medicine. I love it. I just think that it too has its limitations. Okay. Um, DHEA is dropping. In fact, I believe DHEA even drops before progesterone. Yeah, um, I've kind of seen that too. Yeah. It's very interesting to me. Cortisol for a lot of women drops. The scientific literature says it's like one of the only hormones that increases with age, but I, I have just seen in, in my work that cortisol is dropping for a lot of women. It's just like a lack of vitality. Mm -hmm. So hormones are really starting to um, drop, and with that comes diverse consequences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with the cortisol dropping, you know, what, what are some of the things that you recommend to support that? In particular area for women. Yeah, I mean, so um, getting light in the morning is the most amazing hack. It's um, we're so as as humans, we are so driven by by basically the sun, the cycles of the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so just being out in sunlight, preferably within the half hour of waking. I mean, that's I wake at around six a.m. and it's you know not really light till seven thirty. <laughs> So right. winter is always, I'm a bit cortisol and 
uh, challenged. Uh, but you know, that's one of the most incredible, free, helpful things you can do. Um, supporting the adrenals. I, so herbal medicine is actually one place I really do love uh, to do adrenal support. Mm -hmm. um, and then just um, another really super important thing is just eating for blood sugar balance. And, you know, sometimes again, depending on your age and your level of estrogen left, you're eating for blood sugar balance at 40 where you had like, you know, quinoa and beans and sweet potatoes, or maybe you ate on a paleo template, a paleo template that was higher carbohydrate because you're having all the beautiful sweet potatoes and squashes. Once you're say maybe closer to 50 and you've got very little estrogen left, that eating for blood sugar balance may look completely different than even the healthy blood sugar balance of say your early 40s. Because when you have no estrogen or when you have low estrogen, you, you process, the body processes and manages and uses glucose, aka carbohydrates, completely differently. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while to figure that out. Like for instance, I'm, and this is a little bit sad, but I actually don't miss it as much as I thought. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying oh, that food is bad by any means, but I don't eat sweet potatoes anymore. Mm. Oh, oh, my heart. <laughs> that would be the hardest for me to give up. I but I get it. I get it. Like I, yeah. if I eat too much, I can, I can feel that impact for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's so, so, um, so your blood sugar balance to keep your adrenals in check, you know, might really need some, some deep investigation and that blood sugar balance, again, it's really tied into your estrogen level. And when estrogen is low, um, the body just does not have a need for carbohydrate as much as you used to eat. Again, I'm not keto. Um, I am low carb, but you know, that's open to interpretation in terms of like, what is low carb? Is it under a hundred? Is it under 50? Um, yeah. yeah. So. I think I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that up because I think yeah, I mean, I get it. It's not easy, right? A lot of women will work towards figuring out what's best for their body. And they're like, okay, I found it. And then suddenly it's not working anymore. And they're like, but I worked so hard to figure out what's best for my body. And it's just, you know, an acceptance around our bodies are changing. And so how we feed them is going to have to change, particularly through this process. And then probably, I guess, once you're in menopause, you know, it's probably pretty steady of what works for you after that once you come yeah that's a good point for the most part it is yeah yeah so let's talk a little bit about what you feel like about you know hormone replacement therapy um and in terms of is that something that women should kind of look into during perimenopause should they you know wait until they're kind of going into menopause what are your thoughts yeah, I'm a huge fan of hormone replacement therapy. Um, I think that there's just a tremendous amount of fear and misinformation and inaction around it. You do not have to wait until, you, until you're in menopause, but you can, mm -hmm. right? You can. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, um, we, we've been sold kind of the fear narrative by the Women's Health Initiative, which was ended prematurely in 2002. Um, but you know, upon reanalysis, it, it has actually been found that um, that that the estrogen that they used, which is not the best estrogen, yeah. actually still has benefits. So even the crappy synthetic estrogen still has benefits. Yeah. It, so it was the the progestin um, that was um, the issue. Really, the issue. Yeah. And it's so frustrating, right? Because so many doctors still don't understand the difference between progestins and progesterone, right? They call progestin progesterone. And so, so many women will hear about bioidentical progesterone and think, oh, this is the thing that causes cancer, right? Correct. Yeah. So what, what do you tend to see that women, you know, need first on the whole with, with HRT? Is it the estrogen, progesterone, combination? Yeah. 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 It's estrogen really is the most kind of important thing to get evaluated and dialed in. And this is, this is, it's so funny. I get called out on this on occasion, which is, I talk about estrogen a lot. Mm -hmm. right? I talk about estrogen that we make. I talk about estrogen that we can take. And when our, women are like, um, you know, well, why don't you talk about progesterone or what about progesterone? I'm like, oh, it's super important. There's no doubt about that. We absolutely need it. 
But I feel like there are so many people that are promoting progesterone in and of itself. And to me, that's so um, misinformed and stopping short of the equation. And that's because, again, again, I'm never one to put down someone's experience. If you tell me progesterone's working for you, fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. I think I happen to know that at some point it's going to stop working for you because you need receptors. Uh, you create receptors for progesterone uh, based on your estrogen level. Mm. So, so, you know, more power to you if it works. But you know what? Progesterone... It, it has its downside. I mean, estrogen does too. You take too much progesterone, you're going to actually throw your digestion off or, or not a hundred percent because nothing's a hundred percent in medicine, but you know, you're going to, you're going to kind of disrupt and soften and kind of make that lower esophageal sphincter lazy. Oh, um, I've and, never heard about that before. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, progesterone, wonderful, but I, what I love to educate on is that like, let's get that estrogen dialed in. Let's mm -hmm. understand what that estrogen can do for you. Mm, interesting. That, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I hadn't heard that before. Do you um, tend to, and I, you know, I'm sure it's different for different women, but do you like the um, uh, for women to do more oral? I, is there oral um, estrogen or is that all? Um, there is. The cream. Okay. And, uh, so the cream no. you can get on your own, right? But oral you have to get. Oh, okay. No. Technically, I mean, now technically you can get like a super low dose estrogen product with like estriol. Right. Um, well, estriol is easy to get on your own. You can even um, get most likely if you're really motivated and you, you can get a product with a tiny amount of estradiol in it. Mm -hmm. But generally, like when you're talking a pharmaceutical therapeutic amount, no, you cannot get estrogen on your own. Estradiol. So you have to find really an integrative doctor or a doctor that's kind of at least open to, to the stuff to, to yeah. work with. Yeah. Which yeah. I know for some women can be, you know, it can be tougher to find that, although there's more options online and that kind of thing these days yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about testosterone? Do you see that coming in very often um, sort of towards, me towards menopause? I find that's actually the last hormone to drop in women. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and do you find that like when that does that, Sometimes you can really just use the DHEA supplement to help it or go straight I to mean, it's, it's hard to tell what DHEA is really going to do. Mm -hmm. It's like higher in the kind of hormonal cascade. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not against using it by any means, um, but um, I don't know that if women really needed testosterone that I would give her DHEA or I would recommend it. You just go with the testosterone. But again, all of all of these other hormones are pretty much dependent on getting the estrogen level dialed in first. Mm, yeah, so fascinating. I love that. So really when women, you know, technically are in menopause after a year of no periods, right? Yes. Do you ever see women get their period back after not having had it for a year? Yes. <laughs> Occasionally. And they're like, oh. <laughs> yes. So in that situation, I mean, do they, do you kind of just have to shift what they're, what they're doing or you just they, have to, they really have to, that they have to visit their OBGYN at that point and figure out what's going on. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. you know, what, what is it like for women sort of once they're in menopause, what are, what are they kind of looking to see in terms of, you know, okay, this is my sort of like my good spot, my health and vitality, what kinds of things should they be looking for? Um, well, I mean, I feel like that's a, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that because I'm not exactly sure what the question is. Are we talking about blood markers? Are we talking about, physio, you know, like I guess more how they're feeling? Cause I think, you know, sometimes, um, there's just this sort of, uh, open ended idea of like, well, menopause can, you can feel menopause for a while after you're in it. And then some people, you know, I think think of menopause as like, okay, this is the end of the hell of perimenopause and I'm going to feel better, you know? So I guess, what do you see for okay. women that are officially in menopause? Like I, I how they should be, you know, what the goal is in terms of how they're feeling. Yeah, totally can speak to that. So, um, 
you know, it's so funny when I hear women talking about the, the swings of perimenopause and how they wish for menopause. I hear a lot of women say that. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually say that, although I'm a New Yorker, I can be kind of blunt, um, because it is not. I, I, you know, again, I, Christine, I'm again. I, I'm going to say I'm blunt. I'm forthright. Mm -hmm. Menopause sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like straight up. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's the thing. Um, for most women, it sucks. Okay, I'd be remiss in saying that um, it's this way for all women, and this is what it is. Um, and you know, does our mindset play into it? Absolutely, but not like it's not all mindset. I would like never be one of these people that's all mindset. But I cannot tell you how many women I've spoken to are like, I just they they physiologically, mentally, emotionally just unraveled at menopause. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, their, their health took a dive, um, their emotions take a dive, like women tend to, so here's, here's, I'll tell you something common with menopausal women, a little bit depressed, if not depressed, just kind of low mood, low motivation, um, and crave a lot of sugar and carbohydrates. Well, there's several reasons for that, but one of the main things, again, that people don't understand, um, that most people don't understand is that like when your estrogen is low, which is, is what it is in menopause, it's going to be low. Um, it drags down your serotonin. So low serotonin is like low motivation, low happiness, low mood, low zest for life. And it's really because of your low estrogen. Now, could it be life circumstances? Absolutely. Right. Um, but your low estrogen plays a big part into that. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, so, so that, those cravings and that, um, which are again, highly helped by getting enough protein, something that most midlife women don't get enough of. Yep. Um, even if you think you're getting enough, again, just my experience with women is they think that 50 grams a day is enough and it's just not enough for most women. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting the protein can ex it very much help that, but it sometimes you need that estrogen, you need that hormone replacement therapy to really help with the mood and you know just to bring that mood and motivation to stay in the game for for long term right and yeah. do you find that women that start doing um hrt you know particularly with estrogen during perimenopause the transition to menopause is a little bit easier yes yeah yeah i think yeah. that's a, a two thumbs up for getting on top of that you know before and i've, I've heard a little bit about um, some recent research that yeah says that um, your your bone health and your memory over you know the long term is going to be better if you do start the HRT while still in peri like kind of right before menopause starts. Well, I I haven't seen that, but what I have seen is what's called the timing hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, which um, I think it has more to do with heart health, but it's really starting within five years of menopause. Mm -hmm. so really important that if you do and this is why I said I think when we first started out that whole um, I said the most important thing for women to do like as they see themselves going into perimenopause is to get curious and to get educated mm -hmm. yeah there you go so in terms of staying on um, hormone replacement therapy in once you're in menopause do you find that there's a certain time or is that something that women will probably you know do for the rest of their lives yeah it's a great question i mean it's like it's it's a little bit like in this country are you republican are you <laughs> well, it's just like so divided um the functional medicine world I, m myself um my mentors all like rest of your life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily what the major uh, medical societies say. So just, sure. just let you know that. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, as we were talking, I, I thought about like, let's talk a little bit just about how you ended up here and doing this work. You know, you, mm -hmm. I mentioned it in your bio a little bit, it's in your bio, but like what really kind of got you I'm sure that there's a story there that, that got you into like, oh my God, this, this sort of path is not working and, and I need to find something new. Sure. So, so it was about 42 or 43 that I went into perimenopause and it, and I just, 
I knew enough to know that something was just not right. I don't know if I even knew it was perimenopause, and, mm. but I was always kind of holistically minded. And I knew that like going, I live right outside New York City in New Jersey, but I was like, I, the corner, like the GP that everyone goes to in my town, I just was like, uh, he just writes prescriptions. That's really all he does. Really nice guy. He, I could, he's really nice. Like he's so affable. Everyone loves him. But I knew that I knew that I just didn't want a prescription as my only thing. So I did a little bit of research, not quite enough, but a little bit of research. Ventured into New York City literally was the day after Christmas um, about nine years ago. Um, and if you know anything about Christmas in New York City, it's like really busy. It's hard to get a cab. No, it's impossible to get a cab. <laughs> um, and I just say I went up to his office. And again, this was a medical doctor who ran an integrative medical center. I should have known, Christine, the moment I got there, again, so day after Christmas, winter, Literally, the first thing they asked me was, do you want a flu shot? <laughs> uh, I was, yes. I thought, like, I, I should have, like, just turned around because yeah. I was like, it's not what I'm here for. It's pretty not holistic. Anyway, I didn't. I just said no. Anyway, so I like to say the doctor got me out of a hole, but, you know, he just, like, he, he prescribed bioidentical hormones, which, again, I'm not against. Mm -hmm. Um prescribed me a panoply of other drugs mm. just like didn't really spend the time to educate me and I was still very confused and I ended really up minimally better but that was the thing that was the fire under my butt to get me okay there's got to be something better went back to school school was not quite enough then I sought out mentors and specialized programs and now here I am well, I love it because I think that we're in a time that so many women are going through a similar situation, right? You know, they're not getting helped sort of that traditional path. And what's, you know, while that's frustrating, I think it's really cool that it does light a fire under our asses, a lot of our asses, right? <laughs> to, to like figure some stuff out and get educated, as you mentioned, is kind of the most important part. So um, thank you for sharing that story. But I would love to hear about, I know you have um, something really cool coming up that, that you're offering ladies. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So like two things. One okay. is um, coming up. Well, one is my um, women's wellness retreat in Tuscany, in Italy. Uh, That's <laughs> I know, I know. You want to hear something funny? Um, I actually would. All right, I love Italy. I go twice a year. It's just a little, like it, it calls out to me. It's my heritage. Mm. But having said that, where I would really like to do this women's wellness retreat is in Panama, in the middle of Panama, yeah, it's it's amazing. But I said to I said to myself, okay, I can sell Tuscany. Yeah, <laughs> I can sell it. I don't know if I can sell Panama. I was like, right. we have to do Panama the next year. Yeah, I was gonna say get it, get people on board, and then you're like, right. we can Panama. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So um, anyway, so that's coming up October third. It's in a beautiful 17th century restored, gorgeous villa in in the Tuscan countryside. Um, we're gonna have everything from morning nature walks to fireside chats. We're gonna do a gluten-free baking class. Wow. We're gonna do the tonics and tinctures for perimenopause class. You know, we're gonna have, you know, classes. And when I say classes, we're talking 45 to 50 minute classes. I made it the way that I would like to learn, which is not to have someone standing up and yarning on for hours and for hours. Like hours, yeah. <laughs> And that's going to be interspersed with we're going to we're going to hunt for white truffles. Ooh. We are yeah, we're going to do so much fun stuff. Um, and how long is the retreat? It's a week. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Just the perfect amount of time. That sounds awesome. And how many spots are available? Um just uh 15. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Pretty sure it's 15. Yeah, no, it's, not. I think 20. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then you have something else coming up too? Well, so the other thing that I have, have coming up is my midlife hormone mastery, and that's for wellness practitioners. And that, that should be coming out in about a month. And again, that is just really, that's informed by my almost 10-year journey of going from perimenopause to menopause. And it's got everything in there from vaginal health and how the vagina changes in menopause to hormone replacement therapy. How do you walk your clients through making a decision? How do you make that decision yourself? Uh, to um, 
how to interpret the Dutch test, that's about 50% of the course, to strategies for low estrogen. Um, so yeah. I think that's awesome and so needed. So I appreciate you doing that kind of education, you know, because yeah, it's been this kind of this whole aspect of life has been this like myth, right? Or just this, this, we don't know. How what it is. About. It's a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And really kind of understanding all of these different aspects of what is happening is just so important and so important for practitioners to to yes. know that kind of stuff too. So thank you for doing that. So how can people contact you? So um, they can email me at hello at mariaclaps.com. And it's one P, C-L-A-P-S. And then your website is? Just my name. So it's mariaclaps.com. Yeah. And that'll all be in the show's notes too. So people can just click on that nice and easily. So thank awesome. you, Maria, so much for being here with me today. It's been a really amazing oh, conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's so great. All right, you guys, um, check out Maria's website and get on top of signing up for that amazing retreat. I'm like, can I make that happen myself? Um, and we will see you next time, next week with another great guest expert. Bye.